Hello out there and welcome to Public Conscience. This is the anti-corruption program produced by the Progressive Impact Organization for Community Development, Primog. Primog is a civil society organization with a mandate to promote good governance, participation, and accountability in Nigeria. I am Chidozie Obunna with Esther Bassi. Welcome to the program. On Public Conscience on Radio, we seek to evolve a corruption-free society through the amplification of corruption stories reported by our partner media organizations and drawing citizens and government attention to democratic action against it. We also promote integrity by focusing on rare cases of the display of honesty by public and private individuals in the course of their normal activities. The MacArthur Foundation supports the production of this program. Today, we will be shining the spotlight on a non-governmental organization that has been in the business of promoting good governance and entrenching democratic values in the society. This organization in the past 10 years has, through reporting, exposed and combated corruption in the last 10 years. We are talking about no other organization than the International Center for Investigative reporting, ICIR. I'm glad to inform you that they are a decade old in their quest to see a better Nigeria. We will expand the conversation to accommodate the challenges of the media, good governance and, current, and the current state of affairs in Nigeria. Before we bring in our guests, let me chip in here that the ICIR is an independent non-profit news organization the organization promotes transparency and accountability through robust and objective investigative reporting. And at Primog, we regard ICI Aru as one of our most reliable partner media organization. Absolutely. Today's program will seek to assray the challenges of the media in living up to its constitutional billing and the need for good governance, accountability and citizens' participation to be strengthened in Nigeria. For you listening to us, how do you rate the effort of the media in Nigeria in terms of promoting good governance and holding the government accountable? How can the challenges bedeviling the media in Nigeria be tackled headlong? What should citizens do to build a sound and stronger society where integrity is exalted and corruption is reduced to the barest minimum? Be ready to join us through phone and text messages in the course of the conversation. The WhatsApp phone line to send your message is 0902-265-6167. That is 0902-265-6167. Please indicate your name and your location when sending your message. This number is for messages only. Please begin to send your messages as soon as possible to 0902-265-6167. And that is 0902-265-6167. We will give out the numbers to call shortly. Let me remind you that we are looking at the 10th anniversary of the International Center for Investigative Reporting, ICIR. It was founded in 2010 by an investigative journalist, Dayo Ayetan, with the vision of fostering a tradition of journalist, journalistic excellence through creative investigative reporting. It, however, began operation in 2012. The 1999 Constitution did not only guarantee every Nigerian freedom of expression, it also gave obligations to the media to monitor governance and hold the government accountable to the people. This media duty faces challenges ranging from poor remuneration for journalists, poor working conditions, threats and other forms of persecution. Also, the, persecu the persistent failure of the government to take punitive action against culprits of corruption, even after investigations glaringly indict them, is a major setback. It is worthy of note that the democratic structure of the Nigerian state has benefited a lot from the massive input of the Nigerian media for its survival and development. Hence, the importance of the watchdog role the media plays cannot be overemphasized. We have in the studio the founder of and executive director of the International Center for Investigative Reporting, ICIR, Dayo Ayetom. We are glad to have you join us on this program. Thank you very much. And I must say congratulations to you for all the giant strides. Thank you. And we also have the editor of ICIR, Victoria Bamas, 
also joining us. Thank you very much. Victoria, you're welcome to the program. So let's get to it. Let's start from um, the, I will call him the touch bearer, the man mm -hmm. that came with the dream. <laughs> Mr. Daya Ayeton. So take us back to your vision and dreams. Would you say you have been on track all this while? Well, I will say first and foremost that we are not where we want to be because corruption still persists in Nigeria. But um, I will say yes, we have achieved a lot um, that we set out to do. So how did ICR start? We actually started at a time in the life of the anti-corruption fight when we thought that you know government was um, relaxing and didn't have the political will to deal with corruption using the instrumentality of the agencies that it had set up, the EFCC, the ICPC, and so on. And um, at that time, you know, talking to a few colleagues, I thought, you know, how can we actually use the media? If government didn't have the political will to do what it had to do to fight corruption, how could, can we use the media to do the same thing? And so that's why we set up the ICR to complement the work of government, you know, um, um, it's an accountability platform, it's a non-profit, and the reason why we decided to go non-profit is because um, of independence, so that we do not have to rely on corporate Nigeria or government for patronage and all that. We um, seek most of our funding from donor foundations so that we can do our work independently. So what is the ICR about? We set out to build a culture of critical reporting in Nigeria. Bottom line. Why? Because it's not just corruption that we think we are fighting, but impunity. And impunity means that officials of government, just about anybody can commit a crime, some misdemeanor, and know that they have a guarantee that they will get away with it. And we thought that the media, which, like you said, has the constitutional duty of holding government accountable, didn't have the skills, the knowledge, the resources to, to, to do this job. And so we set about building capacity for as many newsrooms as possible. And so that's why over the last 10 years, we've, we've trained over 500. I don't have the, fee, the, the figure, but I'm sure we've trained over 500 scores of journalists not just training them, apart from training them, because we know that the media houses don't have the resources to, to do the investigative work we require. So we have sought funding, and we have funded over a thousand investigative projects for different media houses. And so to that extent, I think that we have um, succeeded in, you know, pioneering that effort of building a culture of investigative journalism in Nigeria. There are others who have joined us who have also done very great work. Premium Times, um, the Cable, Daily Trust, Sahara Reporters. And so there is a groundswell now in our industry of critical reporting and we're happy that we are part of that groundswell. Do you believe that, okay, you are of the opinion that if government had a hand in what you are doing all this year, you wouldn't have gained this success? Let's look at what happened to next. Next was the best thing that ever happened to Nigeria, but it died prematurely because it was doing critical reporting and it was still relying on government patronage and it was relying on patronage from corporate Nigeria. It borrowed money from corporate Nigeria and it was also reporting corruption and all kinds of things about the wrongdoings in corporate Nigeria and they pulled their, their support and it went on that. And so if you want to do an increasingly all over the world, independent critical reporting is supported by independent funding. It can be from adverts, from corporate organizations that we, we are reporting about. It can't also be from government that we are, we, are, we are holding accountable. And so we have to find independent sources of funding and kind of journalism. I'm glad to know there's somebody, some organization ready to uh, fund your project. But as you set out to establish ICR 10 years ago, it must have been very, very clear that you were chatting on a very difficult course. So we'd like to know some of your fears and how did you overcome them? Well, you know, um, at that time I had 
gone uh, um, on a fellowship at the National Endowment for Democracy. I had learned a lot about the work of um, such organizations, public, the Center for Public Integrity, and so on. So I knew a number of things. I knew it was going to be difficult. Um, we were pioneering um, non-profit independent um, journalism in Nigeria. One of the, the, the biggest challenges was funding. I didn't have any resources. And um, in the West, you know, you talk to family members, you talk to foundation. There are people who have a giving spirit. But if, um, in Nigeria, people, even within the family, you know, there are people, many people didn't understand. So it was like you were coming to beg. And so it was really difficult. So funding was a fundamental um, um, problem. And also getting people to work with you who share the vision um, was an initial problem. But eventually, with the help of organizations, foundations like Ford Foundation, which gave us an initial 200,000 grant, which enabled us to, to, to settle down a bit. And also for the MacArthur Foundation, the National Endowment for Democracy, the Institute of War and Peace Reporting. And because people realized the quality of what we were doing and our contribution to, to, to journalism in Nigeria and critical reporting, accountability reporting, we were able to get quickly, at the end of the day, people to rally around to support us. Let me take you back a bit to where you said getting people to join your cause to, that has the same vision with you. So is it that our society, we are having people with fewer, um, let's say, anti-corruption idea or this willingness to fight corruption? Are we having a, a moral, uh, a, a, our, the morality, is it going down? Well, I think that has to be do with the nature of journalism. Even now that we're training journalists and providing resources for journalists to do critical investigative um, reporting, Many journalists are not interested. It has to do with the, med the culture of media corruption in Nigeria. People would rather go to cover beats. There are journalists that we tell to come for training. We are investing in their future, in their knowledge and skills. And they tell us that, oh, don't you know I'm doing you a favor? I'm coming to attend your training. I, could, I should be on my beat making money. And so investigative journalism is not just a risky business, it's um, a thankless, a thankless job. And so getting people to leave the, the, their comfort zones where they cover bits to come and do this kind of thing that you don't earn immediate rewards is very difficult. So investigative journalism should be as good as a calling. Oh yes, it is a calling. As a matter of fact, journalism, none of us here would be in this business if we didn't have a passion. It's a calling for all of us. It's public service journalism we do. Great. Great to know this. Let me bring in Victoria Bamas. She's the editor. Victoria, thank you for staying with us. Okay. And um, I'm sure you've been listening to uh, Dayo say all the things he's been saying. Your, report, your reporters over the years have done many investigative reports. Can you share with us one or two that um, have given you the most satisfaction? Okay, uh, there are so many reports and by satisfaction, you, uh, there are different criteria to look at it. But let me look at some of the reports that we did recently that actually got some impact just recently. So um, let, that was, I think maybe in March this year, we did an investigation around, um, that's the different SAS. Yes, so around some um, police office officers who actually um, collected money from some people for some kind of investigation. The good thing is that after the report, we were able to get the police officers to refund the money to the, uh, would I call them victims in this situation. So, and uh, just recently, as I'm speaking with you now, we have a reporter back on the field. There was this investigation we did around in Quara. So there was this road construction that had been abandoned for quite a while, even though money has been sent, paid and everything. So after our investigation, the government went back, checked on it, and they called back the 
contractors. contractors. And as I'm speaking with you now, we've sent back our reporter to go and check if it's true because they actually reached out and said, okay, this work we've done, this is the situation. They've already started the work now. They've got into 70 or 80 percent. So you see, we actually do get impact in so our report. That them. is where you derive your uh, satisfaction. Yes, it actually. Uh, let me let me <laughs> have your take on this. <laughs> well, if we want to talk about. And the stories we've done that have had impact, we won't leave the studio today. Yeah. At least uh, one or two major <laughs> that so uh, shook the terrain. One of the big ones that give us joy um, is the... So we did a story, we funded a story where the former um, Speaker of the House, Honorable Lasso, had taken 1.6 billion naira um, to um, undertake a water project in Osho State, and that didn't happen. And we did an investigation, and um, after the investigation, set up to call the advocacy and gave a deadline to ICPC to prosecute the matter. At the end of the day, to cut a long story short, the former speaker went back to our community, did the water project, and the water project is working for the community. One of the other big ones that we're happy about is this um, loan shark mm. thing. Okay. So every day, virtually on a daily basis, we get hordes of complaints from Nigerians uh, um, who are complaining about known sharks. They have received loans of as low as 10,000 from uh, um, these um, companies, firms that um, give loans, and they're harassing them. And they are you know, sending terrible text messages about them, breaching citizens' um, um, data um, 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 freedom and so on. And so we've done a lot now after so many stories we've done. The National Assembly has taken it on. They're holding a public um, a hearing. The yes, Consumer yes. Protection Agency has taken it up. I think they are doing a lot of investigation. We've held a Twitter space in, uh, event around it and I think that they have been they are going to be stricter with these loan sharks those are two major ones that we're happy about it's good to know this and uh, Esther you have a uh, question has, related to that all right so because um we believe that your pain no doubt may be that there are no quick actions or to commensurate or respond your responses to your investigate um, investigation stories as regards corruption and stories you've put out there. So how deep is this pain when you know that you've worked so hard, you've made so much commitment to see that an investigation is successful, and at the end of the day, you do not get swift response to the story you put out there, the reports you put out there. How do you feel? How deep is this pain? I mean, some are uh, completely buried or killed or uh, swept under the carpet, to. some of your reports. Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, the man that has driven the knife into our heart is the president of Nigeria. President... Muhammadu Buhari, because he came riding to office on the wave of fighting corruption. True. And a month or so ago, he destroyed all that by How? releasing co two convicted people. I did the biggest stories about Joshua Darie and Jolly Yame. I remember the topic, the, the, the headline, Intel Magazine, the headline of my story on Jolly Yame. I went to um, Taraba State, was the Jolly Looter of Taraba. So there's no question about their criminality. They are convicted. They were convicted through a criminal court procedure. Someone would say uh, he did this in good faith and it, it was in accordance, what, in alignment what, with what good National faith? Council of State. Where he was all He's the president for Christ's sake. With that one singular action, he has done what? For journalists like me, for investigative reporters like me, for investigative organizations, media organizations like ours, he has told us that our work does not matter. For government established organizations like the EFCC, ICPC, who prosecute these cases, the president has told them that their work counts for nothing. The other side of the coin is that we are, we see ourselves as complementing the work of government. Yes. As a matter of fact, we work very well with anti-corruption agencies. When we finish our investigations, there are some things we can't even write about. We hand over intelligence to anti-corruption agencies. We work very well with them. But what has happened in the last year or so is that everybody in government that we write critical reports about 
are using the imprimatur of the state. The, they have used DSS against us. If DSS will just call us up and say, come to our office, and we'll say, who the hell are you? We are not criminals. We are actually helping the work of government. They are using state, including the office of the attorney general, to harass us and hound us. Why? For doing investigative stories. So you are, you are not getting the uh, needed cooperation from the government? Of course not. How, when the president releases convicted um, 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 corrupt um, um, politicians, how can anybody now help the, the media? <sighs> At That's this point, I, I don't know what to add here. But Victoria, how do you feel when stories are swept under the carpet? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's like he rightly stated, you actually feel all the work you've done, you've done, you're trying to improve, let's say, better governance, improve better democracy, improve things around for it to work. And after you've done this, and you expect some kind of reaction, probably from the government or from certain group, and you really don't get that, it's actually a bit disheartening. But like he has already stated, this work is actually like a calling. If you actually do not believe in it, you have, things like this will weigh you down. But irrespective of when it, do, it, do, it does, you actually just continue. And sometimes, again, like an incident we had, um, there is this very big report we did in 2021, that's yeah, towards the end of 2021 around Lagos. So about collection, that's agri how they collect revenue and everything. So I remember talking with the reporter because after it came out, this report trended and a lot of people were talking about it and there was no policy change, nothing. So the reporter came to me and I was, comp that's the, he was an editor anyway, he came to me and I was complaining and I tried to explain to him and encourage him that that's, it's not really a problem, we should just continue the work. Fortunately for us, this year, that was almost three or four months later, we discovered that Lagos actually were or they were instituting some kind of policy change, which was because of that report. So sometimes it might not be immediate, it actually do happen. But as like I say, it's and from, from, from where I see it, I can as well say that there's one report that, you know, we work a lot with ICIR, I must repeat that. Uh, the Office of the Economic Advisor to the President, you know, ICIR, um, you wrote that story, you investigated, and it's we amplified. Story. And um, I, I was also overjoyed that something was done about it because the following year, uh, the same office, the same ghost mm -hmm. officer mm -hmm. was not returned. We now had a human being occupy this, that position. So we must give us to, um, a pat on our back yeah, for absolutely. that. <laughs> for several, um, um, for, for maybe up to two years, we did repeated report on, on that. the office of the chief economic advisor to the government, which receives money in the budget and nobody occupies that position so somebody had been taking the money and then um after our report several reports last year government still budgeted money and we went you know all out use advocacy and today we are happy that the president has um, um, appointed a chief economic advisor. So it is a good also one. with the uh, collaboration of um primary <laughs> so sometimes i wonder where we will be if there's no anti-corruption fight in Nigeria. But at this point, Esther, it would be nice to bring in the listener to join this conversation. Of course, Dede. If you're out there and you're listening to us, please follow us on our social media platforms at Official Primog. The spelling of Primog is P-R-I-M-O-R-O-G. But I have to ask you these questions again. Uh, what is your reaction to the conversation? How do you rate the effort of the media in Nigeria in terms of promoting good governance, citizens' participation and holding government accountable. How can the challenges bedeviling the media in Nigeria be tackled? And what should citizens do to build a sound and stronger society where integrity is exalted and corruption is reduced to the barest minimum? As I think it's all our fights. We have to get involved. Esther. Hello? You are Neman. Where are you calling from? Okay, my name is Ibuku. I'm calling from Wuse. Ibuku, let's hear you. Okay, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to commend media organizations like ICIR and all other media organizations that are trying to put word out there for investigative uh, journalism. Because um, apart from the fact that they do all of these investigations and all, it has also been able to put forward data. Because I'm interested in data and statistics as regards the state of the nation. And through their media reports, I follow them on their social media channels and all. I'm, I'm able to be abreast of all that is happening all around Nigeria. So you've been following ICIR? Yeah. You've been... Oh, yes, I have. Okay. Oh, yes, I have. I started following them this 
Christians, I must say they've really done a commendable job. Really done a job. All right. I, I think um, Mr. Dyer will be smiling at this point. It's good to know that somebody is following you. Thank you, Bukun, for calling. And um, I think we'll have another call. Hello. Name and where are you calling from? Uh, my name is Samu, calling from Zambi. All right. Let's hear you. Um, I was looking. I want to commend the work there. I think it's a very good job. And we are doing Please, can you take that back? You want to... Please, can you take that back? You want to see what? To see more of this going international, not just Nigeria, in Nigeria alone. Because the more we spread it out there, the more we put fear into them. And apart from that, there's also there's just a level of uh, lack of continuation when it comes to history in Nigeria. Imagine the, like, the story of Marvel now. contribution and um let me see someone else is here well does it before you go we, on we, we have yes have messages, a message yes from facebook iris Eder said great conversation quite revealing then obey samuel he said there was a country pretty sad listening to these accounts from the respected journalist your name and where you're calling from my name is esther and i'm calling from Ute. all right esther let's hear you I really want to celebrate all the ICR has been doing so far. I read through their impact story via Google and I'm really impressed. I'm, I've read a lot of what they've been doing so far and I just want to celebrate their impact. Okay. Thank you so I much. Happy anniversary in advance. All right. Thank Please you. keep staying with them and their stories. Thank you so much. All right, um, a lot, a we, lot. we have another message. No, I just quickly want him to react to some of um, what the um, callers have said. But before then, remember in your opening statement, you said that you weren't uh, well received when you started telling people about your vision, about your dream, and what you wanted to do starting up ICIR. Right, so I want to know, it's been 10 years old, um, ICIR is 10 years old, and you kept the vision going. Um, how much of citizen support have you gotten over the years? Oh, well, you, you heard people who are called in and um, saying they follow us and they like what we're mm -hmm. doing. Um, part of what we do is listen to the voices of people. For example, the example we gave about the loan sharks, you know, it's the avalanche of complaints that came from the public that um, made us to do this series of stories we have done. And we were not just satisfied with the stories, we shared our, 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 our stories with the con uh, consumer protection um, um, agency. And then with them, we also partnered to do a Twitter space, which is going beyond our journalistic remit, actually, to the, the bother of um, um, advocacy. Um, so I think to a large extent, because we also, so our strategy has not just been to do our work and leave it like that. Our strategy which has worked perfectly for us is that we have collaborated with other media houses. Mm -hmm. We have been in the forefront of, you know, um, collaboration between media and civil society. The example of Sarah that I gave is one. Beyond that, we are also collaborating, we are encouraging collaboration between the media and even government agencies. 
and that's why we share intelligence sometimes with the military, with D with DSS, with ICPC, so that we can we can all work together because within the space that is called Nigeria, within government institutions, there are people who are passionate about a better Nigeria. Sure. So we can always look for people like that and work with. We work very well with civil society organizations. They do a lot of advocacy around our work. Through social media, we also have a large followership that we always engage with, and we get feedback from them and do um, whatever they want to do. One of the callers, I will get back to you, said something about doing a story and allowing it to die. Yeah, uh, you know, you, you don't follow right. up, you know. So there is this general amnesia uh, and amongst uh, Nigerians. You know that we easily forget an event and mm -hmm. we move on, just like the Magu case. What are you doing to keep up? With stories you've done and never get attraction. Uh, thank you very much. Now, maybe the, um, the media as a whole, but in ICR, a follow up is one of our key uh, backbone, one of the key principles we put on. For instance, uh, recently, when uh, I think Atiku, that's the current uh, PDP presidential flag bearer, prior to the prior presidential election, he actually said something about zoning and what have you, should him, they should, I think, not do it, they should do away with it. What we did was to go back over time to check how many times, what was his position in 2019, what was his position. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do at every point in time. Even this Magu case, immediately the promotion came out, we did a profile to show what was the situation. And so we always do it. And because of we do follow up, that's why we get, generally get results. If we do a report today, there is no, mm -hmm. no result. We we'll actually look for work as can we do, work as can we do, follow up on that report. Sometimes, like I already stated, we we'll reach out to relevant um, CSO, NGOs, partners that will pick and help us amplify it. So, for, for the ICR, uh, follow up is actually a very key principle. Well, speaking for the media, it is true that, you know, sometimes we don't follow up. But the truth of the matter is that in this country, there are too many things happening at the same time. So, so events, it, events overtake the yeah, other. We, we have to cover everything. How many media houses are in Nigeria doing staying on stories? So, the more that um, um, we have security challenges, um, and this challenge, that challenge, all kinds of stories breaking all day, we have to cover them. And what resources do the media have? We've not talked about that. We've not talked about, on this program too, we've not talked about funding for the media. The funding for the media is another issue for another day because Absolutely. you know very well that the conventional media they rely on subvention and then um, adverts and in this time and age that i, I don't think the adverts they're flowing like before we are do we are doing so much online yes. online re reading yeah. so they are they are already getting at the age but i also want the callers to come in once more and um, have their say one of the caller mentioned your publicity going international yeah, I was actually going to, to address that. I think what he's saying is that limiting our reporting to Nigeria, you know, also doesn't help. Mm -hmm. When we externalize it, you know, um, um, that kind of helps. But my attitude to that is let us, let us do our work as much as we can. Um, I do agree, and sometimes when we do stories and they are published by international media, it does help put pressure on government. Mm -hmm. And that is why when a BBC reporter comes to interview the minister, they are able to interview them. They have more respect and so on. Um, but like I said, everything, every little thing we do costs money. So externalizing our work, maybe through technology and all that, would also cost money. But I do agree that if the media does more of that, we will achieve more purpose, at least in terms of putting pressure on government to do what we want them to we do. Need to. But the way we go about it is rather than externalizing the work we do, we work with civil society in Nigeria and outside Nigeria. Our fund, some of our funders are also foreign, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and donor foundation. So working with them also helps. I would okay. say I would say let charity begin at home. But does uh, it before then ICR is ten. So what are the mm -hmm. events you have lined up for celebrating this 10th year anniversary. Okay, okay so um, we, we're commem commemorating this um, on the 22nd with a media event. We think that the most important conversation for the Nigerian media to have today is media sustainability, mm -hmm. the future of viability of the Nigerian media. And so we're holding an international conference um, 
at Transcorp on the 22nd. Um, all the big names, many big names in Nigerian media, Ndoko Obaibwena, the chairman of um, This Day, and Kaberi Yusuf, the um, chairman of um, Daily Trust, Chris Sanyang, um, Senator Chris Sanyang, Kadaria Ahmed, um, Martin Zoloja, who else? And then Professor um, Abigail Ogwezi are coming, you know, to, to, to speak about it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. But we also have um, Shepo Maulele is a South African entrepreneur, a big businessman, investor, who runs one of the biggest newspapers in Africa. They have a good story to tell. So we have invited him. He's delivering a keynote address which will be followed by, and it's a big conversation. There are big people in the room who want everybody to come. Let's talk about how can we make our business viable. In other places, they have found a way around, you know, the challenge of doing business online. I'm already relishing to be part of that program, but let me quickly take this call. Hello? Hello. Your name and where are you calling from? My name is Kobe Mohamed Azibadu. Let's hear you, Mohammed. How are Thank you so much. Hello? Your name and where you're calling from? Uh, my name is Sam. Uh, okay, Sam, let's hear you in one minute. Yes, um, he said uh, it's for me to have uh, this story exposed uh, to get out internationally, but I think the yeah, average you can explore, like uh, BBC, about 24, and CNN, they all have special treatment to it. Let's give a double pass and four, which is uh, inside of Africa. to leave it there please uh, because of our time but i must tell you that if you go to icir the website you will have you know a full load you you've even run away from reading stories there's a lot of stories to read up there and uh, before we end um uh, victoria will give us the the right place to go to the right um, address to go and get stories from them Okay. Uh, you can go on with that. Okay, sure. uh, let me quickly answer a uh, response to uh, mm -hmm. man from the CLO, that Civil Liberty Organization. We actually work with reporter across the 36 states and the FCT in Nigeria. There is no state that we do not have somebody that we work with, like at any point in time. And there is no place. It doesn't matter where the story is happening, provided there is a story happening. We have reporters that we work with. We work, also work with newsrooms across Nigeria. So. Now, the thing with media houses, it doesn't mean you have to have a fiscal location at a place before you actually are existing. What you have, you need to have a network of reporters mm -hmm. and sources, and co that's how it works. So for that one, we cover. Now, if you're actually on, we're actually on, uh, our website is icirnigeria.org, so you can actually go there, and you should also follow us on Twitter and Facebook, at the ICIR. Yes, and the ICIR also have an initiative, that's a fact-checking arm of the ICIR. It's called the Fact Check Hub. So you can also go to, uh, for the website, if you want to access it, is that actually fact check up. Now the good thing with this one is actually the fact check up does misinformation, combating, and not just that, it also try to uh, enlighten the public, give you skills and tutorials, how by, whereby you'll be able to understand quite basic uh, way of identifying misinformation. So I actually think that it's actually a place that we should be, much better in this kind of era whereby we are faced with so many misinformation. So go to the fact check up on Social media is a fact check hub across. If I were you listening, I will make that part of my daily routine to go and, you know, have these facts checked out. But let's run quickly because our time is um, uh, ticking fast. 
the lack of political will and political interference is usually blamed for the inability of our anti-graft agencies to act promptly on corruption reports. How can we overcome this anomaly? Well, I think it's a matter of leadership. If we have the right leaders and, you know, everybody in government understands that the leadership would not accept anything but transparency in the business of government. Every, when, after General and um, 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 the President, Muhammad Buhari was elected in his first time, before he resumed, his body language, there was some, the, the example I give is this. In the past, we do freedom of information requests to ecological funds office, which provides so slush funds for politicians in the past. Not once over years did they give us any information. But the body language before that uh, uh, um, pre President Buhari resumed changed that. So I think it's a matter of leadership. Consistently, even though there are machineries of government, in the agencies that government has set up, ICPC, Code of Conduct Bureau, EFCC, the police and so on, when government needs to act, there is a lack of political will. Under Obasanjo, to a, a, a fair extent, you know, he, we were able to deal with corrupt politicians. That's why Obasanjo set up the EFCC, ICPC. But subsequently, unfortunately, and it's so sad, many people in government talk about fighting corruption and all that, but there has been consistently consecutive government have shown a disgraceful lack of will, political will. On a scale of 1 to 10, yes. uh, where will you put this particular administration on aiding the f your fight against corruption? I on, see, I, on, on helping your work as on a the teacher, fight, fight against corruption. As a teacher, I'm very frugal with Marx. So you, you are not... This government that is using state institutions to fight us will end a fail. That is in my estimation. One, two, or zero? It, it minus 20. <laughs> <laughs> but then, Dizia, we have messages from Facebook. Let's, let's read them quickly. Yeah. This is from Esther Ileson Me. She said, please, can you share the ICRO's social media handles? I think they've done that. Yeah. She will do it again. Okay, okay. So, Iris Edet says, it's quite disturbing to note that some government agencies who enjoy support of investigative journalists to support its policy develop cold feet when such reports are revealing. Another one says, this is from Okewe Gochuku. He said, a very big congratulations to the executive director of the ICIR Nigeria, Mr. Dayo Ayetan, and his team for driving this vision for the past 10 years in spite of the enormous challenges. Political influence and poor accountability system make the job difficult, but we keep pushing, breaking through the barriers all right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for sending in those messages. Um, quickly, as we round up, you we will round up with you giving out the social media handles and your website again so that they will take that. But let me ask this final question directed to Dio. Elections are here again, and um, I know that ICIR, ICIR will be involved. How much can the media be impactful to keep the process on track? It's very important that the media were. Um, involved in the process, um, particularly in fighting this epidemic of misinformation. And I'm happy to tell you that at least a few media houses have come together. Ordinarily, these, these are media houses that would, people would look at as competitors. But the, um, Victoria, how many of them? The yes. ICIR's Fact Check Hub, yes. Premium Times, Dubawa. Daily Trust, um, Fact Matters, fact matters um, the, cable, the Cable, the Cable Facts have come together to form a coalition that will engage INEC government agencies, in fact, teach INEC and its officials how to fight misinformation of all types regarding the coming elections. I'm glad for what you said because, you know, facts are sacred. So we must make sure that people know the truth 
and separate them from lies. Please, Victoria, go ahead with the okay. information okay, that the public need to know. For the ICIR, for the investigative platform, on social media, just check at the ICIR, that's T-H-E-I-C-I-R, for the fact check hub is the fact check hub across all social media platforms. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. And um, this is how we are rounding it up on public conscience today. Yes, that we have to go. Please visit the news page of our website, primognews.org, that is primognews.org for all the details of our reports and interviews. Visit our website www.primog.org to get all the information about Primog. And you can watch our videos on Primog TV, our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to get reminders when we have a new post. We appreciate our guest, the founder and the executive director of in the International Center for Investigative Reporting, Dio Ayetom. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having us. And also Victoria Bamas, editor of ICIR. Thank you very much. And Public Conscience has the support of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. Get more information about the foundation on its website, macfound.org. Join us here again next week for another episode of Public Conscience. And remember to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Official Prime Mug. I am Esther Basi. And remember that the that birth registration and birth certificates are both free if your child is under 18. Help stop the corruption in birth registration and do not pay for birth certificates. Also, remember that you can give us information on a hint about corrupt act through our phone at 0902265 or info at primog.org. I am Chidoze Obonaya. God bless you.